Hey there, let's talk about World War II in the Americas. This is a paper three topic. Uh, this is a presentation that I found online. I did not make this. I'm just going to be explaining some of the stuff on here um, and giving you a little bit of background information, uh, and hopefully in a way that will help this uh, un help you understand this so you kind of know what's going on uh, and that you feel prepared for paper three. Uh, the different things you can see right here uh, that need to be discussed, these are the same things that I have posted on the website. So you can see these, you can read them. You can pause the video and read them right now if you want, but I'm certainly not going to require that because that's kind of old. Uh, some examples right here of old paper three style questions. Now, paper three and paper two are going to be very, very similar. Uh, some of the stuff you need to be answering is going to be like this. You're going to be answering the, que the questions in essay format in pretty much the same kind of way. So you see right here, question one, by December 1941, the United States was a belligerent in all but name. Comment on this statement with regard to the United States foreign policy in the decade before Pearl Harbor. So if I were to be a student and answering this question. Uh, there's a couple things that you need to be looking at uh, that you must be talking about when it comes to answering this question. Number one is you need to be talking about foreign policy of the United States. You are more than welcome to talk about other stuff, but it's not going to get you any points, okay? So do not do that. Stick to the stuff that's being discussed in the question. When it is saying U.S. foreign policy, the decade before Pearl Harbor, make sure you're talking about American foreign policy before Pearl Harbor. So anything that happened before December of 1941, because that's when the Pearl Harbor attacks happened. Um, you need to also be making the argument that the United States either was or was not a belligerent. Okay, so you need to know what the word belligerent means. You need to be defining that. I would define that in your definition, uh, or not in your definition, in your introduction, and then go into create your thesis statement, just like we've always been doing, and then explain um, whether or not this is a true statement in your opinion. Was the United States really a belligerent in all but name before Pearl Harbor because of their foreign policy decisions? Yes or no? Explain it with evidence and then go from there. Uh, number two, the Second World War greatly transformed inter-American diplomacy and economic interaction in the years 1939 to 1945. To what extent do you agree with this statement? So again, a couple things you need to be understanding. You need to understand inter-American diplomacy. Be able to define that. Okay, tell me what is inter-American inter-American diplomacy within the uh, Americas? Okay, so diplomacy between like the United States and Canada. Uh, you could mention FDR's good neighbor policy right here um, between Central America and the United States. Um, economic interaction. How are they working with each other through uh, finances? Okay, we're not necessarily talking about foreign policy. We're not mentioning uh, uh, domestic policy. We're talking about economic interactions from 1939 to 1945. Don't talk about the Marshall Plan that happened after the war. It's not during the scope. We don't want to talk about it. Don't talk about stuff that happened before then, okay? For example, the Spanish-American War would not be something we're talking about right here because it's not within the 1939 to 1945 uh, time span, which we are given. You need to be explaining the extent to which you agree with this statement. Number three, to what extent were attempts at his, his, uh, him hemispheric, I can't read today, hemispheric cooperation successful before and during the Second World War. So hemispheric uh, cooperation, define that. Um, this is the cooperation among the countries in the United States working together. Was that successful before and during? If you only talk about what happened before the start of World War II, you will not receive full points. If you only talk about what happened during the war, you also will not receive full points. Make sure you are discussing things that happened before and during the war in regards to his hemispheric, I cannot say that word to the life of me, hemispheric cooperation in the United States. Uh, to what extent? How far did this go? To what extent questions? Make sure you're really hitting them hard. So that's going to be some background information on how to go through and answer these paper three questions. Now, some global context, some of the content you need to understand. Uh, foreign policy in the Americas was oriented inward during the 1930s, okay? Isolationism was the kind of defining moment um, of, or defining idea of foreign policy, not just within the United States, but within the Americas as well. There's this kind of belief that uh, problems in Europe are European affairs. The United States, Canada, um, and the rest of the Americas, they're far away from Europe. Don't let European problems influence what's going on in their country, so they want to be isolationist. Also, during the 1930s, we have the Great Depression going on. This is going to be starting in the United States in October of 1929, but it is going to spread throughout the world. Uh, when you are in crisis yourself, you really don't have time to be focusing on what's going on 
outside of your own country. You need to solve what's happening at home first and then deal with the other issues. So because the Great Depression was destroying the economy of the United States and the other countries within the Americas and really throughout the world, uh, these countries are focusing heavily on what's going on within their country. Okay, The Canadians are focusing on what's going on within Canada, even though they're going to be the most internationally focused. Um, the Americans are going to be focusing pretty much on just what's happening within the borders of the United States. They're not really concerned with what's going on outside. They're really not concerned with what's happening in Europe because it's not on their radar. Uh, as I've just stated, Canada was the most international um, of the countries within the Americas at this time period, and they're really only focusing on trading with the United States. So they're international, but it's really not that international, okay? When you share a large border with the country, culturally, uh, you're very, very similar. You are technically international, but it's really not that international. Um, Britain is no longer dominating the foreign policy of Canada at this time. Britain, a former or Canada, a former Canadian colony. Um, there is still a, it's still a Commonwealth. Okay, there is still international or relations between the two, but Canada is kind of ruling itself, so to speak, at this time. It's not really being controlled by the British as it previously was within its foreign policy. FP stands for foreign policy. Um, though Canada was the first country in the United States or in the Americas, okay, uh, to declare war when Great Britain declared war. Um, so they're going to join with the British very, very quick. Um, granted, the rest of the countries are going to join in later, but Canada was the first. So that is important to understand. Otherwise, though, uh, the Americas are going to remain largely neutral during the start of World War II. They're going to be viewing this um, as a problem that the uh, problem that Europe's having, not an issue that needs to be addressed by the uh, the countries in the Americas, uh, all the way up through uh, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, until the attack on Pearl Harbor. Once Pearl ha Harbor happens, the Americas get involved quick. The United States will declare war the next day. A number of South American and Central American countries follow quickly, which is really a testament to the successfulness of FDR's good neighbor policy. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Some limitations to this was the Lend-Lease Act, um, where the United States was lending weapons um, to the British, uh, basically as a way of saying, we're going to lend you these weapons, we're going to lease you these weapons, because uh, there was a ban on selling uh, ammunition and weapons for the war effort. Uh, but they're just going to be living or lending them, okay? We're just going to give them over and let you use them as long as you need. Um, we'll lease these to you. You'll give them back to us later because you're at war. You need them. We're not at war. We don't need them. Um, that question talking about to what extent was the United States um, a belligerent in neutrality, this would be a good way of talking about that, okay? They're giving weapons to a country. Uh, they're technically neutral, but they're giving weapons to a country to fight. They're really neutral in only name. Um, the United States is not. They're officially neutral, but it's definitely obvious which side they're rooting for. Also, you could talk about the Atlantic Conference, where they basically agree to work with one another. Um, it's not going to be a military pact like NATO, for example, but they're going to be aligned quickly. Uh, granted, this is all going to change in 1941 once Pearl Harbor is attacked. Okay, You can see right here in this cartoon that international trade between Canada and the United States right here. Investments for Canada. Boom, boom, boom. That's just Great Britain, not Canada. Okay, But they're going to Canada. Both countries are investing heavily in Canada, and we're going from there. Now, uh, unneighbor-like history of the United States in the Americas. This is getting into FDR's good neighbor policy. Number one is the Monroe Doctrine. Okay, the Monroe Doctrine, I like to describe like a dog peeing on a fire hydrant. Now, a dog takes a leak on a fire hydrant uh, for one of two reasons. One, it has to pee, drink a lot of water. Uh, it's a natural thing to happen. Number two is it's trying to mark its territory. The Monroe Doctrine is the American equivalent of peeing on a fire hydrant, okay? The United States is marking its territory. Uh, this is going to be the guiding principle of American policy in the Americas, really up until FDR. Um, it's all it's stating is that European nations would not be coming in to North and South America because that is in the American sphere of influence. This is controlled by the Americans, the, the United States. And if you try to come in here, we are going to have a problem with you. Basically, North and South America is close to uh, colonization, except by the Americans. Peeing on the fire hydrant, marking their territory. Uh, this is going to be taken further with the Roosevelt Corollary. In 1904, Teddy Roosevelt um, speaks softly and carry a big stick. So basically... Um, you know what? We have this Monroe Doctrine. This is our territory. Uh, if you come over here and try to do this, we will shoot you. Um, 
think of it in a real simplified terms is it's the Monroe Doctrine, except with guns. Monroe Doctrine is just saying, hey, this is closed. Don't come here. Roosevelt Corollary is like, hey, this is closed. Don't come here. If you come here, I'm going to shoot you. Uh, that's the best kind of simplified way of looking at these two doctrines. Make sure you understand that. Now, um, the other thing important to understand in this whole idea is the United States is closing it to outside intervention. They're not closing it to their own intervention. So if you're in Central America, um, you might be happy in the fact that other people aren't coming into your country, Europeans, but it's not stopping the Americans from coming into your country. And the Americans are going to be doing that. If you look right here at this map, this is going to show a history of American intervention in Central and South America. Uh, you can see Mexico right here, Veracruz 1914, um, Cuba, okay, with the Platt Amendment, Guantanamo Bay, uh, U.S. occupation in Cuba, Haiti, Dominican, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Venezuela, Panama, Nicaragua, um, all these different countries that the United States is involved in, okay? Uh, and they're involved in these countries pretty much exclusively for their own, uh, their own benefit. Um, we're going to look at Panama, okay? The United States is going to support a revolution in Panama. Previously, Panama was controlled by Colombia. Um, the Americans wanted to build a canal. They saw the uh, success of the Suez Canal in Egypt. They're like, hey, we can do this over here and bypass going around South America. It's going to save a lot of time. and We can put a tax on that and make some money off of this deal. Colombia didn't want to sell the land, so the United States supports a revolution in Panama um, for Panama to break away and become its own country because then they could build the canal exactly what's going to be happening. Uh, we're going to look at Cuba with the Spanish-American War. Cuba was occupied by the Spanish. The Americans had the ship down there, the USS Maine, which mysteriously exploded. We get some yellow journalism and stuff going on. Ultimately, Spain's going to lose the end of their colonies right through there. Cuba is going to be a free country, put in quotes, where the United States has real uh, authority over vetoing pretty much anything they want as a result of the Platt Amendment. Puerto Rico is going to be an American colony. Um, still, even up until this day in 2020, Puerto Rico is not its own independent country. It is a territory of the United States. Same with the Virgin Islands right down there. So the United States is heavily getting involved, heavily imperialistic, particularly in this region. They view it as their sphere of influence. They want to have some inf uh, influence and control. Now, in the 1920s, we get Hoover, okay? Um, Hoover is like a vacuum when it comes to the economy kind of sucks uh he tried to improve u.s relations but he fails miserably then in 1929 we get the great depression in the great depression uh hoover was heavily urged do something get involved make this happen you need to start simulating the economy Hoover's like, no, I'm just going to let it happen. As a result, it really got much, much worse. Uh, we're going to have the Great Depression happen right through here as a result of the Wall Street crack. We get the Smoot-Hawley tariff right through here. Um, it's just not a good time for economics, particularly in the United States. Um, Hoover is blamed a lot for that. It's not necessarily fair to totally blame Hoover for that. Um, but Hoover did play a pretty big role in not really doing much when it happened. Now, the Smoot-Hawley tariff, 1930. Um, this is a protectionist law which is going to raise duties on 20,000 goods. This is basically um, a tariff, as I've talked about before, is a tax. So it's meant to protect American agriculture and industry from the effects on Great Britain. So if you're importing stuff, there's going to be a tariff put on that, which is going to make those goods you are importing more expensive, meaning you're going to be buying the American goods, which is going to be good for American farmers um, and agricultural industry because it's cheaper to buy their goods versus the other ones. Um, going on right through here. Uh, many historians and economists argue whether or not this was actually effective. Um, the reasoning why is other countries are going to uh, create a tariff in response. So for example, if you're previously buying stuff from Britain and all of a sudden you place a 30% tariff on that, which would be a pretty high tariff. But if you do that, that good's now going to cost 30% higher because the person investing or bringing it in is not going to pay the tariff. That always, by rule of economic, is passed off to the consumer. Uh, so they're going to be responding by doing the same thing on American products. So some people are arguing that this was good, that this is going to help the American um, agricultural industry. Others are saying this is simply going to prolong the Great Depression by pretty much starting a uh, trade war. Um, there was going to be re reciprocal, um, reciprocal 
can't speak English today. It's only my native language. Oh, well. Reciprocal trade agreements later, which is going to lessen the impact and try to make the situation a little bit better, kind of ending this trade war of sorts. But uh, a tariff was placed. Was it good? Was it not good? History is going to let you decide on that one, done as a way of protecting American agricultural. Now, 1933, FDR is going to be elected. Uh, true, uh, Hoover is going to lose his bid for re-election, largely due to his response to the Great Depression. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is going to come in. He's going to want to improve relations um, with Central and South America. He's going to mention this during his inaugural address, saying the United States will become a good neighbor, okay? We're tired. We're sorry for all the bad stuff we've done in the past. We're going to be a good neighbor from this point forward. Um, he's going to state that the United States would not intervene unilaterally in Latin America. They would get involved if other countries are trying to get involved, um, but they're not just going to come in themselves and try to dominate everything like they have done before. We're going to get the Montevideo Con uh, Convention of Rights and Duties of the States. 19 countries are going to go, including the United States, uh, which is basically going to assess the sovereignty of the nations in um, in Central and South America. We're going to get Secretary of State Hull, who's going to be quoted as saying, no government need fear any intervention on the part of the United States. So basically, we've done this in the past. We're done doing it now. Good neighbors are going to stop intervening in your affairs, and we're going to quit doing that. Now, the good neighbor policy abrogated, which is meaning repealed, the Platt Amendment in Cuba, um, which means the United States really had the authority to control what's happening in Cuba. The Cubans can make their own decisions. However, um, the United States could override those decisions and make their own decisions. So at the end of the day... Cuba was technically free, but it wasn't free. Uh, during this time in the Good Neighbor Policy, the Platt Amendment would be repealed. Uh, Cuba is going to get a dictator, Ramon San Martin, uh, is going to come to power. The U.S. does not send troops to intervene because the United States says, we're not going to get involved in your, affair, your affairs. The United States Marines are going to leave Haiti and Nicaragua, uh, countries they were previously occupying. The Haitians and Nicaraguans did not like this. As you can imagine, it's probably not very good to be occupied. They're going to leave. They're going to renegotiate the terms of the Panama Canal Treaty, um, and they're going to get rid of their ability to seize lands and control politics in these countries. Now, as I've stated, the Platt Amendment is going to be abrogated in 1934, which means repealed. History of the Platt Amendment was signed in 1901 after the Spanish-American War, um, which was a series of conditions that must be met before Cuba could become an independent country. Um, this is going to basically be saying that, hey, you're technically independent. However, we're controlling you. Uh, it's kind of like a parent with a young teenage child. Uh, that kid might have a vehicle, might be able to drive, go some places on its own, but at the end of the day, that parent is still in control. That's kind of what Cuba is going to be like at this time. Cuba could not sign treaties on the world um, world stage that would uh, compromise its own independence, so they can't make promises with other countries. Uh, the U.S. reserves the right to intervene in Cuban affairs, so if Cuba is doing something the United States does not like, the United States has the ability, and they will, intervene in that affair uh, and they're going to have lease bases on u.s island in or in cuba in perpetuity so the united states is going to basically say hey if we want to have a military base here you're going to let us have a military base here uh, the one they're going to keep is guantanamo bay which is controversial uh, and still operating today in 2020. It's going to be used in 1906 and 1909, and this time the United States is going to occupy Cuba when its government's collapsing to prevent fighting on the island as a way of trying to maintain some stability. Um, you could argue this was probably only for the American interest. You could argue this was in the best interest of Cuba. Um, that could go really either way. Fact of the matter is, it's a result of the Platt Amendment. Historian Louis A. Perez, Louis A. Perez Jr. is going to argue that the Platt Amendment resulted in the conditions it had hoped to avoid, including Cuban volatility. Uh, so basically, they're saying that the goal of the Platt Amendment was try to make stuff calm in Cuba. Let's make the situation calm. In reality, they're arguing that it actually made the situation worse. It made people more volatile, ready to explode, ultimately leading to Castro and the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Now, the good neighbor policy, 1936, we're going to get the Buenos Aires Convention Conference in Argentina. The United States will not use force to protect business interest. Um, the United States will use force if it's protecting a military interest, but not for business interests. The United States is not going to use political pressure, and it's going to have non-recognition of states. So the United States is not going to be sending in the military to protect economic interests. So, for example, if the sugar plantations in Cuba 
uh, owned by the Americans are being threatened, the United States is not going to send its military in to intervene with this. We're going to get reciprocal trade agreements. The United States is going to low, lower tariffs and duties on specific countries um, in exchange for trading rights. So they're going to get rid of some of the taxes and lower them uh, as a way of enhancing trading rights between Central and South American countries and the United States. An example, 90% of Brazilian exports became duty-free, so no taxes. The United States is going to become the largest trading partner of all Latin American countries, with the exception of Argentina, which is a South American country. Then we're going to hit the Declaration of Solidarity of America at the 8th Pan Am Conference in Lima, Peru, 1938. 21 American republics agreed they would continue to cooperate, work to defend each other against all foreign intervention. So basically, uh, these countries within uh, North and South America agree they're going to work together to keep other countries from getting involved, uh, really kind of trying to push away the imperialistic ideals of foreign countries. We're going to work together. We are in the same region. We should be aligned. We're going to be aligned. At this conference, FDR is going to argue that... Um, giving some reasons why the Americans should work together. He's going to be saying these all right here. Three years ago, recognizing that a crisis was being thrust upon the new world, set an example to the whole world by proclaiming a new spirit, a new day in the affairs of the hemisphere. You who assemble today carry with you in the, your deliberation the hopes of millions of human beings in other less fortunate lands. Beyond the oceans, we see continents asunder by old hatreds and new fanaticisms. Can we, the republics of the new world, help the old world to avert the catastrophe catas catastrophe Ugh! which impends yes i am confident we can basically can we work together and be a better world yes i know we can good neighbor policy some of the limits argentina is still closely aligned with the united kingdom and germany um Talking about that a little bit later on with Germany, particularly uh, in the United Kingdom. American economies are going to become reliant and connected to the um, United States economy. So the countries in Central and South America, their economies are basically going to be hooked to the United States' this economy. So if the U.S. is doing well, they'll be doing well. If the U.S. is doing poorly... They're also going to be doing poorly. Uh, they're going to directly and indirectly support pro-American dictatorships such as those in Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba. So the United States um, is agreeing that they're not going to intervene. However, they're still kind of intervening. Um, countries like Nicaragua, Dominican, and Cuba, uh, dictatorships the United States is going to be involved in. Oil is going to play a big role, as oil always does. Okay, it's nearly going to break the good neighbor policy, but eventually it will be resolved. Mexico and Bolivia both have large reserves of oil owned by foreign companies such as Standard Oil. Um, Bolivia is going to confiscate Standard Oil's assets without compensation. Um, so it's going to take all their oil and say, hey, this is ours. You can't have it. Um, pretext that the company was illegally selling to Argentina, something that was against the agreements. Um, whether or not this is actually happening, it's debatable. Fact of the matter is Bolivia did not want the United States Standard Oil Company uh, taking their oil. The United States is going to stop providing all bank credit um, to these countries to get them to quit doing this. Eventually, the United States will receive $1.5 million uh, as a result of the company's loss in 1940. However, this nearly broke the policy. Um, basically, to put it in simple terms, uh, Standard Oil was use, uh, had had rigs set up in Bolivia, taking their oil and selling it. Bolivia is saying, hey, we need more money. Um, this isn't good. We don't like this. You're selling it to Argentina. We're going to get involved, and you're not going to get any of the money. Um, it was resolved, but got really, really tense. Now, there's going to be American cultural exchange going on at this time. The United States wants to portray positive uh, culture throughout the hemisphere, positive American culture. They wanted to negotiate, um, negate pro-Axis sentiment in the region, so they want to stop people from being aligned um, and having some sympathies towards the uh, the Nazis in Germany, the Italians, or the Japanese. Uh, they're going to have tourism via passenger, via passenger ships between the United States and South America, Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. Uh, there's going to be cultural exchange programs, cultural understanding, motion picture and radio, uh, press portraying Latin American culture positivity, positively. Um, so we're going to have uh, some Central and South American actors and actresses come up to Hollywood and make movies. Um, we're going to have all these different things like Weekend in Havana, um, different movies where they're going to portray the uh, Central and South American countries in an incredibly positive way. Now, there's going to be a debate. Was the United States being benevolent, being a good, kind person, or were they doing this only in their own self-interest? Was this something the Americans were doing simply to 
benefit themselves, or were they trying to be good people? Uh, Peruvian leader Ra Raul Haya de la Torre uh, saying the U.S. was the good neighbor of tyrants. Um, basically, they're not doing this for their own reason. They're just, or for their, everyone's good. They're doing this for their own reason. Just another way to maintain regional dominance. Um, say it's like we're looking good, but we're going to be involved. Uh, some are going to say um, that there were dictatorships that were allowed in the region before 1939, so this is proof that it wasn't working. Uh, historian Peter Smith is going to say this was the golden era of U.S. relations within the region. Um, so there is really a debate on whether or not the United States was doing this for their own interest or were they doing this to be actually kind. Um, that could be argued either way. The fact of the matter, though, is this does um, – really lead to some good cooperation among the American countries. Now, we're going to get Pan American Airways, which is the largest international airline carrier for years. It's going to be a catalyst for American uh, inter-American relations okay, between North and South America. It's going to create it as a counterbalance to the German carrier in Colombia um, because there was a German airline in Colombia. They're going to be worried about this because they don't want German air bases and military planes located anywhere near the Panama Canal. So the United States is going to be heavily funding um, Pan American Airways as a way of allowing them to counterbalance the Germans. U.S. government, others give large contracts to businesses creating um, a monopoly in uh, in Latin America. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of money. The United States is heavily trying to get involved, get some economic interaction going in Latin America. Now we have to talk about Canada. So if we're looking at Canada, July 1st, 1867, uh, this is where Canada officially becomes a dominion, um, self-governing within the British Empire. So they are still technically a commonwealth. That's why if you go to Canada, the Queen of England is on their money. However, they're governing themselves. In 1931, we get the Statute of Westminster, uh, which is British Parliament can no longer legislate for dominions. Okay, So um, at this place, uh, the government of the United Kingdom, okay, of Britain, is not going to be governing what's happening in any of the dominions. So it's not going to be commonwealth okay, of British Empire. They can still make requests for Canada uh, within their constitution. However, they cannot actually determine what's happening. In 1939, we get the first American country to declare war on the Axis, okay? Canada was the first country to declare war on the Axis. This is um, around the same time that Great Britain is going to declare war. Remember, September 1st, 1939 is where Germany invades Poland. Quickly after this, France and England respond by declaring war. Canada is not going to be after that much longer, um, and they are going to be the first, um, the first country in the Americas to declare war on the Axis. Then in 1982, Canada gets total independence with the British crown as the head of state officially, so they're no longer uh, aligned with the British. Now, Canada, Canadian American diplomacy. We have here a picture of the Peace Garden in North Dakota, my old state where I used to live for college. Uh, before World War I, Canada foreign policy was subordinate to the United Kingdom. So what the UK does, Canada follows. Uh, that's going to significantly change during the interwar period, mostly due to the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Uh, the Canadian divisions are going to be overrun. Um, are they going to overrun German strategic positions, creating a sense of national unity and earning them a seat at the Paris Peace Conference within the League um, of Nations that are going to be joining there at this time? Um, this is a major battle for uh, Canadian um the Canadians, and it's going to really show a lot of dominance by the Canadians. Um, it's going to be a sense of national pride and national unity for the Canadians because they did this alone. Okay, they took over the German positions alone. They did not do it with other people. Um, by 1920s, it was a con uh, control of his own foreign policy and own military affairs. No longer are the British controlling this. It's going to be codified, officially made law during the Statute of Westminster, which I've already talked about. So the dominions of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, and um, South Africa are going to become Commonwealth, which means they're equal in statute status, but closely related to their mother country. Um, so they're equal. They're equal own independent countries, but but they're closely, closely related. Now, Canadian-American diplomacy going on. The United States, instead of the United Kingdom, is now going to become the primary trading partner of the Canadians, primarily because it's legit logical. It's less expensive to ship something south just across the border than it is to ship it across an ocean. Uh, the United States is going to provide manufactured goods for resources. Canada's got a lot of natural resources. The United States has a lot of manufacturing. They're going to be trading... Um, we're going to get the Great Depression and the Smooth Harley Tariff resulted in Canadian U.S. tariffs um, or Canadian tariffs on American goods. Remember, at this point, the United States is trying to protect agricultural influence 
um, in the agricultural industry within the country. They're going to increase these tariffs, um, and there's going to be Canadians responding by putting their own tariffs on American goods. Trade's going to drop by 75%. So this is that argument of whether or not this actually hurt or helped. Um, and extended the Great Depression. And that could be an argument in favor of extending the Great Depression. Reciprocal trade agreements resolved some of these issues, but not all of the trade conflict. There was still some issues going on with trade between the United States and Canada. Canadian diplomatic challenges. Uh, we're going to get the Pan American Union in 19 or 1890. Excuse me. Canada is going to be denied entrance into the League of Nations for America by a U.S. veto uh, invoked during or by using the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, the statement is Canada is not an independent republic. It's still aligned with Great Britain. Therefore, they're not going to be involved. Um, this is something the Canadians are like, screw you, America. Uh, we don't like this. We're our own country. Just because we're aligned with the Brit British doesn't mean we can't be involved. And the United States says, not happening, bro. Um, it's going to cause some tensions. Canada's trade with Latin America amounted to 2 to 3% of its total trade. Um, which isn't very much. Okay, it wanted to remain differential to British investments in the region. So they're going to try to basically say like, hey, we're not going to really step on your foot, Britain. Um, we're not going to get too involved in this circumstance, in this situation. Um, so they're going to be trading primarily with Britain and the United States, mostly uh, switching into the United States once uh, they get some more independence from the British, because it's just logistically a stronger position. Now, American react to Europe and Asian conflict conflicts. Okay, this is eventually going to be drawn in the 1930s. At this point, the United States is not a part of the League of Nations. Um, they're not going to be involved in what the decision of the League of Nations is. So previously, we had the League of Nations, this decision that was really the idea of President Wilson. Um, and the United States is like, hey, we're not going to be involved, which is ultimately one of the reasons the, U or the League of Nations failed. Um, the United States is not involved. What would happen if U.S. foreign policy conflicted with the League's decisions? This is why. Um, if the League wants to do one thing and we're involved, it's going to tie our hands, as you can see in the cartoon right here. Um, the world conflict was secondary because Americans are really more concerned with what's going on in their own country. Uh, this is during the Great Depression. Depression. They're more concerned with what's happening at home than they are with what's happening abroad. Uh, this is going to be a similar issue within the entire Americas as a whole, and this is going to be the primary reason for American um, isolation during the 1930s. Now, uh, they have the Manchuria crisis in 1931, which is where the United States is going to push for the League's intervention uh, because China, or Japan, excuse me, is going to invade Manchuria in China. Uh, the United States refuses to recognize it as Japanese territory, saying non-recognition. This is Manchuria. This is China. This is not your territory, Japan. There's going to be diplomatic disapproval, which is going to sway the League to form the Linton Commission. Um, the United States is going to appoint a member of Frank McCoy to serve on the League's commission, even though they're not actually a part of the commission or a part of the League of Nations. Um, there is some argument that this is when um, Japan's really starting to flex its muscles, Imperial Japan. The United States doesn't really do They're pushing for something, but the League of Nations doesn't do anything. So the one group that can actually intervene and do something doesn't do it. Another argument as to why the League of Nations ultimately failed. End of the day, Japan will invade Manchuria and occupy Manchuria up until the end of World War II. So this commission formed by the League of Nations is going to ultimately determine that Japan is guilty. They should not have been doing this. This was wrong. Now, what do we do? Uh, Hoover is going to say, we're not going to put economic sanctions um, on Japan because we do that. It's just going to cause a war. Um, so the decisions they ultimately make are irrelevant. Okay, it's irrelevant that they decide they're guilty because they're not going to do anything. Um, this is like if I said, hey, uh, stop speeding. And then you said, what are you going to do about it? I said, nothing. You're going to keep speeding. Um, that's exactly what happens here. Britain's going to threaten, um, say that sanctions are going to threaten stability in the region. Um, Britain's got colonies in the region. They don't want to threaten any stability. Uh, so they're not really going to do anything. Countries are unwilling to sacrifice their own economy at the expense of the U.S. to increase trade um, without hurting Japan. Because it's like, this isn't just going to do anything. So Japan, you shouldn't have done this. Stop doing it. We're not going to stop you. Um, pretty much this is appeasement uh, in the best way of looking at it. Okay. We're going to the M crisis conclusion, which is United States foreign policy is pivotal in avoiding international sanctions against Japan's aggression. Um, so basically, the United States plays a major role in these countries not really doing anything. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later on in the impact this is going to play because a couple years later, Japan's going to attack the United States of America at Pearl Harbor. Now, America um, and other uh, responses to the actions in Europe and uh, in Ch Asian countries. Canada and Manchuria. So the Prime Minister Bennett is going to saw can see Canadian foreign policy as British foreign policy. And it's a part of the Commonwealth. 
Um, but it's going to be much more pro-American um, than the British. Many Canadians are going to disagree with what Bennett is saying. Um, they're like, hey, dude, you don't know what you're talking about. Stop. Um, Canada, they're arguing, could serve as kind of a middleman between the United States and Canada or, or and the United Kingdom um, when it comes to talking about what to do with Japan because the Canadians are kind of the middle road. Um, the United States and Canadians disagree. What country do they both have really big investments in and big uh, relations with? They have good relations with the Canadians. So the Canadians kind of could serve as a middle ground. The United States is going to argue for moral condemnation. Um, the United Kingdom is going to argue for conciliation. Okay, so let's figure out how we can work with this. Um, the United States is saying, morally, this is wrong. You can't just take a country. Canada or United Kingdom, not necessarily feeling that same way. United Kingdom did not want to look weak and ask Canada's government to give a speech except, accepting the Lytton Commission's recommendation. So they don't want to say it themselves because it's going to look, make them look weak. So they're going to say, hey, Canada, will you do this on our behalf? Japan is going to withdraw from the League of Nations in 1933. Um, at this point, the United States is going to shift with a hardline policy towards Japan. Um, basically, just like, you can't do this. We don't like you. Stop, 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 stop. We're going to make your life absolutely miserable. Now, in Europe, Hitler is going to be appointed Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Americans are going to have some mixed feelings. Remember, there was a massive wave of German immigration to the United States in the 1800s. Many Americans are of German heritage. Okay, Some are going to see him as Germany's savior. Uh, they're going to see him as this man who's going to help Germany get out of the really bad situation that it is going to be in. They're going to wish to emulate his populist movement in their own countries. Um, and this is not going to simply be uh, happening just within the United States. This is something that's going to be going on all around the world. However, there was no consensus in any country. Fervent nationalism, this extreme, extreme pride in your country, was more prominent in countries with German immigrants, okay, like Brazil with Gutilio Vargas. Um, the United States, as I mentioned, did have a strong German immigrant population. Um, others are going to fear that racial and authoritarian policies of Adolf Hitler. They're going to see kind of the writing on the wall. One example of this is FDR, okay? Now, the Abyssinia Crisis, 1935. The United States is going to first pass a series of neutrality acts, which states the United States is not going to get involved um, in any country and not going to trade with any country that's involved at war. Uh, we're not going to be involved in this. If you're going to fight a war, we're not going to trade with you. Now, there's a number of reasons this could be beneficial. Number one, um, these countries depend heavily on American trade. It's going to keep them out of war because they're going to need that trade. Number two is the way of the United States to not get involved in the crisis. Um, the U.S. is also going to provide no aid and promise to provide no aid to Abyssinia, um, which is going to assist in a death blow to the League. Whether or not you agree with that could be up to your own um, opinion based on evidence. Canada is divided, okay? Bennett, the Prime Minister's government in Ottawa, wished to abstain from condemning Italy and Abstinia. Abstinia. Um, basically, they're like, hey, we're not going to condemn you, but we also don't like this. Um, because that's going to place or Canada on the side with Germany, Austria, and Hungary. They're like, yeah, we don't know what we want to do. Um, the, foreign delegation, da -da -da, the foreign delegation to the League would break with its own government and impose sanctions. Um, so Canada's foreign government is going to really go against what's going on in Ottawa, and they're going to impose sanctions on the Italian. They're going to side with Britain against the United States, wanting to impose some action and not just condemnation. So not just saying, hey, this is bad, stop doing this. They want to do more. As a result of this, Bennett, the prime minister, is going to lose his uh, election. He's going to be ousted, and a new government is going to come in. Now, the United States is neutral, okay? The policy of neutrality. Uh, feeling that participation in World War I was a mistake, okay? Like, the United States should not have gotten involved in World War I. Nothing good came out of it except a bunch of dead people and a lot of money spent. So they're going to respond with the Neutrality Act in 1935, onwards which intended to keep the United States out of future wars. This policy was problematic, uh, difficult to follow, and difficult to apply. A series of neutrality acts. First Neutrality Act of 1935 gave President the power to prohibit U.S. ships from carrying American-made munitions, so ammunition, um, guns, anything like that, to countries at war. Uh, it also could prevent American citizens from traveling on those ships um, of countries that are at war. So if Germany is at war and you're an American citizen, you're not riding on a German ship. Second Neutrality Act is going to ban loans or credit cards, or credits, not credit cards, those aren't around yet, Credits to countries at war. 37 is going to provide the or forbid the export of munitions um, for use by either side of the forces in Spain. So it's focusing just on Spain during the Spanish Civil War. The Neutrality Acts of 37, the fourth one, um, authorizes the American president to determine what could and could not be bought. Um, so the president's getting a lot more authority. 
uh, is kind of taking the first one and giving it a lot more authority to the president. The fifth one, president could authorize a cash and carry export of arms. Um, so it's going to lead to the Lind Lease Act. Um, they had to be transported to the country's own ships. So the president wants to do it. He can say it, but they cannot be on American ships. Yeah. Proclaimed North America a combat zone. Uh, this is due to the U-boats going on in the region. So let's give this argument some evidence. Now, neutrality and justification is the Nye Commission. Republican senators led investigations into why the United States joined World War One. Uh, one of the primary reasons was U.S capitalist bankers had invested into nations at war profiteering from war companies war profiteering you make money off the war example dupont and jp morgan banking so because these companies are going in they gotta get some money back if they're not gonna get money back it's gonna be problematic Therefore, let's go to war. We're going to get the Ludlow Amendment, which is the most a popular proposed change to the Constitution, which means a national referendum to declare war. So the people would have to vote on whether or not the United States would go to war. It is popular, but it does not pass. The Gallup poll in the, uh, this time is also going to say 70% of Americans thought the U.S. involvement in World War I was wrong, that the United States should not have gotten involved in World War I. 70% of Americans, that is a large percentage, nearly two thir or three quarters um, of the United States of America thought that getting involved in World War I was wrong. War or Roosevelt is going to give a quarantine speech where he wanted to alert the population to world danger. Um, basically, what's going on in Europe is problematic. What's going on in J with Japan is problematic. You need to be aware. Newspapers, uh, populations are going to be highly critical. FDR is going to be saying it is terrible to look over your shoulder while trying to lead and find no one there. Basically saying, if you're going to be the leader, you need to have people behind you, okay? If you look behind you and there's no one there, that's problematic. So Roosevelt's trying to say, watch what's going on. This could be very bad. The rest of Americans are like, shut up, you're wrong. We're going to have the Pain A incident, Jap uh, which is when Japanese are going to sink U.S. Navy ships and three standard oil ships in the Yangtze River um, outside of Nanking in China. The U.S. is going to demand an apology and compensation for the... Uh, What's happening, the incident is going to then be closed, which will lead to a moral embargo when American business is encouraged uh, to refrain from supporting the Japanese and trade or trading with Japanese. It's a moral embargo, so you can still do it, um, but you shouldn't based on morality. Now, views on the U.S. government from FDR and the neutrality. The government was isolationist. Um, you can see these different things right through here. I'm not going to go through like Divine and Snowman. Just pause the video and read them. Um, but Congress is ultimately going to pass and FDR will sign five, <clears throat> excuse me, five different uh, neutrality acts. FDR was a gradualist, so we're going to slowly, kind of gradually get to this situation. Um, we're going to slowly uh, try to stretch the authority, bending truth to educate the American people. Um, as H.W. Brands is saying, uh, his inclin in or FDR's inclination when it comes to foreign affairs was to work slowly. Don't just go uh, guns and roses come and blazing. Um, we have to go kind of slowly getting in. FDR was also a pragmatist, okay? He was closely tied with what public opinion was going. Um, he would only move quick once an unequivocal popular consensus. So once the vast majority of people wanted something, then Roosevelt was ready to go quick. But until then, Roosevelt would move slow. Uh, the Spanish Civil War, the United States is going to invoke the Neutrality Act saying we're not going to trade with either side. U.S. businesses are going to overtly assist the nationalists. Texaco is going to credit gas um Supply gas on credit to Franco, who's ultimately going to be a fascist. Mexico has par or participated actively in the Civil War. Um, government's going to be supporting the Republicans. They're going to contribute little, um, mostly just moral support. So uh, the United States officially is going to invoke the Neutrality Act. However, American businesses and countries in the United or in the Americas are going to be getting involved. We're going to have the Chinese Civil War. Roosevelt did not um, follow the Neutrality Act because there was no declaration of war. Therefore, it was not officially a war. You kind of found a loophole right through here. They're going to be simplest or sympathetic towards the nationalists, okay? So opposed to Mao, um, who was leading this revolution. Then the J uh, Japanese get involved, and everything is going to kind of change. We're going to have the Munich Conference in 1938. Roosevelt increasingly is on the side of intervening. Um, he is looking at what's happening with Hitler uh, and Mussolini in Italy and Germany and deciding this is not going to be good. We need to get involved. But he's going to persuade that appeasement is a better option because the vast majority of the world would prefer appeasement, which is when you give dictators what they want and hope they don't ask for more. 
over his implication on appeasement. The conference was hailed as a success. Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, was seen as a hero. FDR is going to write Hitler a letter after invading the rest of Czechoslovakia, basically demanding that he does not intervene. Um, Hitler is going to read it and then mock it. So Hitler is like, ha ha ha, who do you think you are, uh, FDR? I'm going to keep doing what I want. Invasion of Poland, first September 1939. Uh, at this point, uh, the hemisphere in Europe is mostly uh, anti-Axis, even though neutrality was officially maintained. Um, so North and South America are officially neutral. Uh, they're not officially on one side of either. However, they're against the Axis, and it's very obvious they're against the Axis. Canada, though, is going to enter the war. Now, uh, neutrality and U.S. rearmament. Um Reduced uh, forces after World War One. United States is going to reduce troops after World War One. They're going to fix the department and uh, budget for the Department of War. Uh, so they're going to be spending less money. They're not going to be increasing it. The Navy is going to grow, um, and it's the only branch of the military that grows. In 1934, Nira provided um, the Navy with $237 million for warship, warship construction. So the United States is building up their Navy because the American Navy was fairly weak. Uh, they're going to try to build it up. From 1935, armed forces budget was increased uh, because of the situation in Europe. They're looking at what's going on in Europe, thinking this could be problematic. We might need to be getting involved. Uh, so after the Munich crisis in 1938, Roosevelt said he's going to spend another $300 million on armaments, um, asking Congress for $552 million for defense expenditures uh, to prepare the country for war. Roosevelt sees the writing on the wall. He wants his nation to be ready. Canada's participation after the British declaration of war seemed to be a foregone conclusion. Basically, when Britain gets involved, Canada would be involved as well. Um, Unlike World War I, uh, Canada is deciding to do this on their own because of the Westminster Statute. Um, it was debated in Canadian Parliament, and on September 10th, just nine days after, ten days, excuse me, after the invasion, uh, Canada had declared war. Canada was not prepared for the war, simply put. Okay, they were not ready. Economic depression made military spending incredibly unpopular. It's going to double uh, in 1938, double again in 1939, so that ain't good. Um, half of that is going to the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, they're going to create the British Commonwealth Air Training Force, which is mostly just advanced air training um, conducted in Canada by the British as a way of kind of working together and training pilots. Um, they're going to train a number of pilots. Many of them are going to be sent to the Battle of Britain, trying to protect Britain from a Nazi invasion, which ultimately the Nazis did fail. Uh, right here, you can see a map of Canadian involvement in World War II. Battle of the Atlantic, um, one the Canadians were heavily involved in, and Canadians, or Canada's small navy uh, is going to be responsible for patrolling the North Atlantic to protect convoys um, of troops, convoys of material going to Europe to be used in the fighting as well. Um, so I'd recommend you probably uh, pause the video at this point, look at some of the different things going on right in here. I'm not gonna go over them all in detail, but do understand some of the significance of what's happening. 1939 to 1941, the United States um, is going to hope to kind of remain out of the situation. Uh, FDR though is going to request billions in defense spending and naval development uh, because he realizes there's a good chance the United States might be drug into this war. We get the Two Ocean Act, which is gonna add 201 ships, which is 71 or 70 percent increase uh compared to what the united states already had they're going to advocate for the removal of neutrality at laws um, because they're not helping allies indirectly support the enemies um, instead of removing them they're going to get develop the cash and carry system which is where arms are paid in cash and then transported by the allies so uh the united states would be selling weapons to the allies however they will not be transporting them so if they're going to sell a weapon to the french the French need to transport it over. After winter of 1939-1940, France has fallen. Britain um, is going to now be looking on its colonies and its commonwealth for aid. They need the help from other people. Uh, ships are constantly crossing the Atlantic to facilitate trade of war materials and commodities. Uh, the United States is pretty much supplying the British war effort at this time. We're going to his hemispheric neutrality belt, 300-mile neutral zone um, declared, and that is going to be violated. Germany is going to torpedo any ship they transport or they believe is transporting these goods um many american british or not british american mexican and brazilian ships are going to be sunk as a result of this um so the uh if you remember back historically speaking world war one one of the reasons the americans got involved in world war one was the sinking of the lusitania similar things are happening right here and the united states is not getting involved the united states is going to be moving closer to war churchill is going to wrote right to roosevelt and he is going to be basically saying that Britain uh, can't afford these materials. We need your help. We're broke. Um, 
September 1940 destroyers for a base deal. Uh, the United States is going to find a way to get around this. Um, they're going to get 50 American destroyers for 99-year uh, leases on British bases in the Americas. So they're going to make a trade. Lend lease aid where they're borrowing money um, to fight against Germany, a way of going around the Neutrality Act. So there were in place still. However, the Americans found a way to go around this. Canada is afraid it's going to lose out on its economic ties with Britain. Um, so they're going to make the Hyde Park Declaration, which is when the United States and Canada make a mutually beneficial deal. Um, United States war materials made in Canada could be included in the Lend Lease Act. So basically Canada is now joining in the Lend Lease Act. Some Lend Lease money is going to go to Latin America. America. Um, the United States is going to be doing this because they're seeing this as a way of protecting themselves. Now, the Nazi is going to get involved in Latin America after the fall of France. The Dutch and French possessions in America were handed off to the Germans. So the Dutch and the French did have land um, in North and South America. As soon as this happens, after this happens, uh, the Germans are going to take control of this. The Pan American Union stated that um, in adherence with the Monroe Doctrine, these possessions would not be recognized. Uh, so um, other countries are like, we're not recognizing this. This is still French land. This is still Dutch land. Germany doesn't control this. Uh, Argentina is going to dissent, feeling that it was an excuse for U.S. annexation. Um, Argentina is kind of going to be the odd duck out here when it comes to supporting the Nazis and the Germans. Um, we're going to the Office of Coordinator of Interior American Affairs, CIAA, not the CIA, prevent and eliminate access to espionage in America uh, through propaganda. Um, so they're going to basically go through and make sure um, that there is not uh, access uh, influence in motion pictures, radio, anything of that nature. Um, the United States is going to be uh, be speaking about their openness uh, and sympathy towards their southern neighbors. They're going to target Brazil, which has a large Japanese and German population, um, which is something they're very worried about because if they have a large Japanese and German population, they're most likely going to be more sympathetic with those sides. And Argentina and Chile are the other countries they're going to be targeting because they have pro-fascist regimes um, with large German populations, which is not something the United States is going to really like.